Um, so this is the Office of Health Standards Compliance. So they're a department, uh, an entity within the Department of Health. You can um, sort of equate the office to a clinical auditor general. Um, they audit public facilities and they give them on a, cl on a clinical basis. So they will assess them for compliance of, amongst a range of metrics. And they have 13 broad metrics and they're around this wheel over here. Um, <clears throat> There's the, the green ones, which they call domains, and then the blue ones they call priority areas. But I just want to draw your attention to the two lowest scores that they achieve here. Leadership and governance and operational management. I mean, that's dismal. Um, I know 35% I know is a pass in the public education yeah. system, but <laughs> I don't think it's a pass in, uh, in, a, in a health setting. So the lowest score, to reiterate, on leadership and governance, the, go the government is telling us themselves that the issues governance and management frameworks <clears throat> it's not a lack of resources i'll get to the resources later so they themselves are telling us this um but obviously it's not convenient for them to to raise this because creating a policy that uh, increases more taxes is quite easy it's all a paper exercise but actually getting into facilities and changing management and getting them like a management turnaround that's much much more difficult um quite possibly maybe impossible for for the government in its current form. On this issue of universal health coverage, and I explained how it's been conflated in here, but there are three entities that have affirmed that South Africa achieves universal health coverage. So the International Labour Organization's World Social Protection Report, quite a mouthful that, um, <clears throat> some years ago, found no ga coverage gaps in South Africa, either from an inability to pay or from a lack of access. So if you have private medical scheme cover, you obviously have access there. But if you don't, the public sector will cover you. There are no, there are no gaps in it in terms of it. We actually have a very substantial public health system. Um, and I'll also touch a little bit there as well. The World Health Organization and World Bank have, achieved, have accorded South Africa a universal health coverage index of 0 0.67. One is perfect, zero is non-existent. No country achieves one. Sub-Saharan Africa minus South Africa achieves 0.4, a lot lower than South Africa. Most developed economies are somewhere between 0.7 and 0.8. So we're not much far behind what many developed economies have in terms of universal health coverage. The Health Market Inquiry, which was run by the Competition Commission, spent six years gathering much evidence around, um, mostly focused obviously around the private sector, but it found there its conclusion that South Africa already provides near universal access to healthcare, either through private, um, publicly available services or regulated private markets. Okay, so this whole aspect of universal healthcare is a misnomer, it's a red herring. We don't need NHR to achieve something we've already got. Your policy can't, can't be aiming to achieve what you already have. Um, so it's, it's clearly diagnosed the, the incorrect thing. So what, what the policy process mm -hmm. should have addressed, so in, in the public sector, as I say, governance and management capacity. Now, just to give you one small example, this is not by any means all the problems, but I think as you might well know, if you have governance problems or your management capacity falls apart, all sorts of problems start creeping in where people can take advantage of it. So I'll give you, yeah, um, one of our colleagues at the Health Policy Unit a few years ago uh, from a company called Healthman did some analysis on public sector doctors, individual practitioners who had their own private sector practices, which is allowed in terms of, of the... Uh, within the Department of Health, although it's meant to be capped at a maximum of around, I think it's about 8% of total hours can be spent in the private sector. Uh, it's under a policy called REWAPS, which is quite a mouthful for remunerative work outside of public service. But the policy is heavily abused. They found that some of these doctors are the largest claimants from medical schemes. So how is it possible that you're doing your job in the public sector and you're the, one of the biggest claimants from medical schemes? It's because you're spending all your time in the private practice and simply not doing the public sector job. Now, I'm not to say all of them do it. Um, it's a process called moonlighting, so where they work without authority outside of the public sector. So they're still drawing their public sector salary and not working in the public sector. None of this gets addressed or looked at. Um, a professor Rispel, I think it was, at Fitz University did an analysis on this almost 10 years ago amongst nurses, and she found that 40% of nursing staff in the public sector actively moonlight. Now, 40% is not a small number, a small, small proportion. That's very significant. So it's the type of thing, I'm just using it as an example, as I say, to show how we, where the governance frameworks fall apart 
and no management is happening of other facilities or staff. These are the problems that start creeping in, and the people who suffer are the users of that public system. Because 100% would be the best. Correct, yes. <laughs> In private sector, it's cost and affordability that's the challenge, and it is becoming a huge problem. I, you know, I'm, I myself am involved in the private sector. Uh, we have some colleagues here tonight as well. It's, it's concerning to see how the coverage levels are dropping. Um, ultimately, and all because of the, 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 the massive increases in price. But we have the health market inquiry that spent six years gathering much evidence, suggesting, and through evidence-based research analysis from numerous experts to create a blueprint for fixing the private sector, bringing in more competition, improving affordability and stuff. And that policy now is just lying there. Well, it never became a policy, but it, the, the report is lying there gathering dust um, with NHR taking center stage on everything because it's, it's treated like it's a panacea that's just magically gonna fix all these problems.